in section 2.5, it's really a continuation of what we did in 2.4 where we're trying to find zeros of polynomial functions. We now just broaden that idea. Uh, in 2.4, all of our zeros were real zeros, so they actually gave you an x-intercept. Now, we'll still do those. We can still have a real zero, but we'll also bring into the conversation complex zeros and how we deal with finding those. So first up, as far as our objectives in this section, is we will use the rational zero theorem to find all possible rational zeros. Uh, and then we will go in and use that in combination with, uh, with other techniques such as synthetic di division to find the zeros of the polynomial function. We'll solve polynomial equations. We'll use the linear factorization theorem to write polynomials with given zeros. It's one of my favorite things to do in this section. And then the last uh, topic of this section, which I'm not as crazy about just because it's hard to uh, uh, apply, is using Descartes' rule of signs. We'll talk about what it is just so uh, you know what it is and can use it, uh, but I don't really encourage uh, you know, continued use of it that much just because it's not that beneficial. Uh, now, first up, looking at an example here, if I ask you to use the rational zero theorem to tell me what all the possible rational zeros are, of any polynomial. Now the polynomial I'm showing you here to give you an example of this is f of x is equal to 4x to the fifth plus 12x to the fourth minus x minus three. Now as long as your polynomial is written in descending order, then the manner in which you find the possible rational zeros is always, always the same. All that you're going to have to do is look for positive and negative factors of the constant which in this case is three, divided by the leading coefficient, which in this case is four. So now please notice how I did that down through here. I said the constant term is negative three and the leading coefficient is four. Really the signs are irrelevant because we'll be doing positive negative uh, factors. So factors of the constant term negative three, well, positive and negative one can be multiplied to get a three as well as a plus and minus three. So now the factors of the leading coefficient four, we know one is a factor, two is a factor, and four is a factor. So positive negative versions of all of that. So the possible rational zeros of this polynomial function are the factors of the constant divided by the factors of the leading coefficient, my factors of three divided by factors of four. And now notice, you might as well, and normally what I do is I just put a plus or minus out in front of a parenthesis instead of in front of every single term. So I'll say it's positive or negative. My first term, well, one over one. You see that there. My second term, three over one. That's right there. My third term possible, one over two. Uh, then I went ahead and did one over four there. And then I did three over two and three over four. That is every single possible rational zero of this polynomial. Now, that's a total of two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 possible rational zeros. So in and of itself, it doesn't really help you like, great, uh, it could have 12 different uh, values that could be its x-intercepts. How do I find which one is? Well, you could start using synthetic division, you could graph out this function on your TI-84 calculator and see which of these values where it crosses the x-axis, that would be beneficial. But this is just as important in, in what it doesn't tell you as what it does. So like if somebody thought, well, hey, could two be a x-intercept on this function? And you can look at your possible rational zeros and say, no way, two is not a, what about five? Could five be a, no, it's not one of the possible rational zeros. Any rational number that is not included in this list is not a rational zero of this polynomial function. So we have our list of possible rational zeros there. Now, what if I looked at another polynomial here and I say, find all the zeros to this. And I specifically gave you one in which factoring by grouping would fail miserably. You can't group the first two and the second two 
and hope to try to factor that out. It's just not going to work. So when I'm thinking, okay, how do I find the possible rational zeros of x cubed plus x squared minus 5x minus 2, I say, well, it's fairly easy to find the possible rational zeros. It's just going to be the positive or negative factors of the constant divided by the factors of the leading term, which is just 1. So I can say it's going to be positive or negative factors of 2, which are 1 and 2, all over the only factor of 1 is 1. So you can see it's the only possible options are 1 over 1 or 2 over 1. So you can say your, your only possible rational zeros are positive or negative, uh, positive or negative 1 and 2 here in this case. So we only have po four possible rational zeros. That makes it pretty easy to just go ahead and try to use synthetic division to determine which of those four possible rational zeros are actual zeros. So I do that. Now, some people would say that this is not an efficient use of time to go in and use the rational zero uh, test, or I should say synthetic division, to test each of the possible rational zeros. This is showing me that negative two is not a rational zero. How do I know? Well, because it didn't come out even when I synthetically divided. Remember, it's only a rational zero if you get a remainder of zero whenever you synthetically divide. The fact that I'm not getting that tells me negative two is not a rational zero. When I try to use synthetic division with a negative one, I get a three, which tells me negative one is not a zero. Now, in order to avoid what I've done right here, now, if you like using synthetic division, there's no reason to avoid it. You can go ahead and do just like I've done here, and it's in fact what the book suggests that you do. But if you wanna get your calculator involved, all you have to do is go to y equals, enter that function in, and then all you'll need to do is go to zoom six, the standard zoom screen. Doesn't matter if it's a beautiful graph of the function, you only need to see the x-intercepts anyway. So it would show you whether it's crossing at any x value between negative 10 and 10. And you could quickly and easily see, nope, it's not crossing at negative two, it's not crossing at negative one, and it would save you the hassle of this step right here. Or I should say, save you the fun of that step. It's not a hassle, it's fun to do it. Uh, but now, whether you use synthetic division or you use your calculator, you can quickly see that negative two and negative one are not zeros. So I can say, well, then I'll need to move to the positive ones. What about one and two? I try to test one. When I try to use synthetic division to test one, I got a remainder of negative five, which tells me one is not a zero either. So then there's only one possible rational zero left with the two. Uh, and if you're unlucky like I was in this, it's the very last one you try, you're like, Great, you've done three synthetic division problems that you didn't have to do because all that's showing you is that that term is not a factor. Finally, I get to the one that is a factor, or I should say a zero in this case, I get a zero remainder. So I know I have a rational zero at x equals two. Now, a lot of times students will just stop there and say, well, okay, I don't know what to do from there. Oh, ho, ho, what do we do from there? The fact that we know we have a rational zero at two tells us that that polynomial is factorable. If it has a solution or a zero at two, then the corresponding factor is x minus two. Please notice how I factored that out down here. I went back and I also showed the synthetic division because when you synthetically divide with that two, you're supposed to understand that what's left over, this is the constant, this is the coefficient of x, this is the coefficient of x squared. So if you factor out an x minus two, then this uh, polynomial factors to be x minus two times one x squared plus three x plus one. That's what I've put down here. Now, I know that x squared plus 3x plus 1 is not factorable because I can't find factors of 1 that sum to get to 3. However, we can easily solve that quadratic. So once you get it down to a, a quadratic equation, if nothing else, you can always use the quadratic formula to solve it. That's what I've done on the next page. So x squared plus 3x plus 1, 
we know a is one, b is three, c is one. So x is equal to negative three plus or minus the square root of three squared minus four times one times one all over two times one. And then you say, well, that's going to simplify. The inside of that square root is going to be 9 minus 4, which gives me the square root of 5. I have negative 3 plus or minus the root of 5 over 2. So that really doesn't simplify beyond that because I can't factor anything out of my numerator to cancel with the 2 in the denominator. So that gives me two other factors. I already had my 0 at x equals 2. That was one solution. My other solutions are going to be negative 3 uh, plus the root of 5 over 2 and negative 3 minus the root of 5 over 2. You'll see I've, I've wrote all of those three answers as the solution set to this polynomial. Now, it's always better to go ahead and put your answers in exact form. So notice I left it negative 3 plus the root of 5 over 2 negative 3 minus the root of 5 over 2 as opposed to some wimpy decimal approximation. So only use decimal approximations if you're asked. Uh, up next, we're looking at properties of roots of polynomial equations. So if a polynomial is of degree n, then uh, counting multiple roots separately, the equation has n roots. So if you're thinking, okay, how many times should it cross the x-axis or at least have roots because it could have complex roots, uh, you should say, well, if it's a degree n, it will have n zeros or n roots. Uh, now, remember, some of those roots could be like a triple root, a double root. Uh, you could have a root occurring four times where it goes up and touches and goes back in the direction. So all of those with multiplicity of roots would count n to the number of n. So please don't think that you're always going to have as many x-intercepts as you do whatever the degree n is. That's normally not the case because some will be repeated and you could also have complex roots that don't cross the x-axis. Now, what we have to remember about complex roots is that if a plus bi is a root of a polynomial equation, then you also know that the imaginary or the complex number a minus bi is also a root. You cannot have one complex root in isolation. They can't occur that way. So if a plus bi is a root, then a minus bi is a root, and vice versa. If you're told a minus bi is a root, then a plus bi is a root. So if I say the imaginary number i is a root of your equation, and you can say, well, okay, then if i is a solution, then negative i also has to be a solution. Because you have to remember i is the same thing as the complex number 0 plus 1i. So 0 minus 1i would also be a solution. They always occur in conjugate pairs. Uh, let's see an example of that. So this time I'm looking at the polynomial x to the fourth minus 6x cubed plus 22x to the second minus 30x plus 13. We're setting that polynomial equal to zero. First step that you and I should both do whenever we're thinking about one of these is think about well, what are the possible rational zeros every single solitary time. It's the factors or the positive negative of the factors of the constant divided by the factors of the leading coefficient. Well factors of 13 are just 1 and 13 and of course factors of 1 are just 1. So I know my answer is positive negative 1 over 1 or 13 over 1. That's why I get the four possible rational roots of 1, negative 1, 13, and a negative 13. Now, you would either try synthetic division or you could use your calculator to expedite the process to see which one of these rational roots are actually solutions. I went ahead and used synthetic division to show you how that goes here. When I tried to synthetically divide with a negative one, I had a remainder of 72. That clearly shows me negative one is not a rational zero or not a rational root of this equation. I tried a positive one. And when I tried the positive one, ding, 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 I got a remainder of zero, which tells me, yes, I know x equals one is a solution or a root for this polynomial. Now, 
using that as a fact, I can say, well, then I can use that to factor out this x to the fourth minus 6x cubed plus 22x squared minus 30x plus 13. Please remember, if x equals 1 is a solution, then the corresponding factor is x minus 1. So you'll see I have a factor of x minus 1 here. Now, when I factor out that x minus 1, this shows me what I'm left with. Remember, constant x, x squared, this is x cubed. So I have the remaining factor, 1x cubed minus 5x squared plus 17x minus 13 left over. And now you could use synthetic division. Again, you know these are the only four possible rational zeros. Uh, I know negative one is not a rational zero. I've already shown that one is a rational zero at least one time. It would be wise to try it again. So, whoops, that's what I do. Uh, I can say, I know that these are still my possible rational zeros. Let's try to factor a one out again. But now please remember, you're not factoring or synthetically dividing one into the original uh, polynomial anymore. You're factoring one into the simplified cubic polynomial with coefficients of one, negative five, 17, and negative 13. We already know one synthetically divided into the original, and we got this polynomial left over. So now if I divide one into the remaining cubic with the coefficients one, negative five, 17, and negative 13, you see that's what I've done here. Well, please notice, yet again, you get a remainder of zero, which shows me that x equals one is not only a root one time, but it's a repeated root for this polynomial. So then I can say then my polynomial x to the fourth minus 6x cubed plus 22x squared minus 30x plus 13 factors to be x minus 1 times x minus 1. Prob probably better to write that as x minus 1 quantity squared. And then what I'm left with is just a quadratic, x squared minus 4x plus 13. Yet again, that quadratic is not going to factor. You can't find factors of 13 that sum to get to negative four. So that just means my other uh, roots, they're not going to be rational. They're either going to be irrational or possibly complex. We put that into the quadratic formula to decide that. So I already know it factors to this. And then that final factor of x squared minus four x plus 13, I bring that down. I use the quadratic formula to solve it. So x is going to equal positive four plus or minus the square root of b, which is negative four quantity squared minus four times a times c, four times one times 13, all over two times a, which is just two times one. Now inside your root, that discriminant, you're going to get 16 and then minus four times 13. That's 16 minus 52. That gives me a negative 36 on the inside. Now, we know that square root of 36 comes out as a six, but the square root of negative one is gonna be the imaginary number i. So this simplifies to be four plus or minus six i all over two. Now, two can distribute into both terms in that numerator, so I can say, well, my complex factors are gonna be two plus or minus three i. Gorgeous. So now I can say the solution set for this uh, original uh, 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 polynomial equation, which it was this polynomial set equal to zero, we had a solution of one, and you don't have to write the solution of one twice, just saying it's a solution of one, one time is sufficient, and then it's a multiplicity two, but you don't have to write it twice, and then the solution two plus or minus three i. Now you could write that as two minus three i comma, two plus three i and show out those two solutions. Uh, now, if you have some general polynomial equation with coefficients a sub n, a sub n minus one, all the way down to your constant of, of, of a sub zero, our goal is going to be to write that polynomial and, as in terms of linear factorization. All that means is that any greatest common factor constant gets factored out of all of the linear factors, and then you're going to have um, all of your linear factors look like x minus two, x plus five, x minus eight. 
So we're going to have x plus or minus some constant in here. Now the reason I have minus in all of these is because the actual root it only occurs at the value C1, C2, Cn if those terms are being subtracted inside each of your linear factors. Okay, now let's take a look at a problem like that. So if I tell you to find a third degree polynomial function f of x with real coefficients that has negative three and i as zeros and such that you know the f of one is equal to eight. Now, I love these types of problems. Love, love, love. So these are working backwards. Before we had polynomials and we factored them, found the roots and found their solutions. Now we're taking roots and solutions and working backwards to find the polynomial. Cool stuff. So, I know that the polynomial in factored form is going to be some constant a sub n times the product of my linear factors. Well, I already know if it has a real uh, coefficient root of negative three, well, how can it have a solution of negative three? It has to have a factor of x plus three. How can it have i as a zero? Well, if x equals i, then x minus i would equal zero. You have a factor of x minus i. Now, please remember what I was talking about with the complex uh, roots. If zero plus i is a root, then zero minus i must also be a root. They always have their complex conjugate root uh, as another root. They cannot occur in isolation. No imaginary solution can ever occur once. So you say, well, if x minus i is a root, then you have x plus i as a root because you know that negative i would also be a zero. And if negative i is a zero, then x minus negative i would be a root, which gives you the x plus i there. Now, we could, we, we definitely have all three of these linear factors. We could have some constant coefficient multiplying them all. We don't know that yet. So I'll leave that a sub n out in front. Sometimes I'll call that value just to c in, in my work, um, but we'll leave it a sub n here to, to keep the book's notation. Whenever I multiply these three, the x minus i times x plus i, that's just gonna give me x squared plus one. And then you take your x squared plus one, multiply it by x plus three. I got this four term polynomial of x cubed plus three x squared plus x, plus three. Now, I go to this page and I can say, okay, then some constant times this polynomial, and how do I know what that constant is? Well, I go back and, it, uh, and I use this last fact. I know that when I plug one in for x, the y value has to be eight. So when I plug a one in for x, I'll get one cubed plus three times one squared, plus one, plus three. If you notice, well, that's gonna give me one plus three, plus one, plus three. That's already an eight. So I know a sub n times eight is equal to eight. That just tells me that a sub n is just a constant coefficient of one. So my answer in this case, since a sub n is just a constant coefficient of one, what is f of x? f of x is just x cubed plus three x squared plus x plus three. I didn't need to multiply anything in this equation to get the solution of eight. Now, keep in mind, what if I would have said f of one was 16? If f of one was 16, then your value for a sub n would have needed to be two, and you would have had a two times all this expression, and you would have had two x cubed plus six x squared plus two x plus six as your final polynomial. It's just in this case, uh, since a sub n didn't need to uh, multiply that eight by anything to get the eight on the other side that I could stick with the original polynomial that I had. Pretty cool problem. Uh, the last topic in this uh, section talks about Descartes' rule of signs. So if you have a polynomial function, then it's saying that the number of positive real zeros, pretty easy to find here, it's just saying it's nothing more than the number of sign changes of f of x, or that number of sign changes could differ by some positive even number less than that. You're thinking, 
Well, why would it differ by a positive even sign number? Remember, complex solutions occur in pairs. So if I say, well, I, I think there could be six positive real zeros. Well, well, what if there's a complex solution? Oh, okay, then there's four. What if there's two uh, pairs of complex solutions? Then you would only have two. So if you have six sign changes, then the number of positive x-intercepts that you could have would be six, four, two, or zero. Uh, what if you had five sign changes? Well, then you could have five x-intercepts on the positive side, could have three, you could have one. So it always differs by some positive even integer less than the number of sign changes. Now, please notice it says, if f of x only has one variation in, si in sign, then f has exactly one positive real zero. Now, you're like, well, okay, I know how many, or I, I know how to guess how many positive real zeros or positive x-intercepts there are. How would I determine how many negative x-intercepts or negative real zeros there are? It's the exact same idea. All you're going to do is evaluate f of negative x. And the number of negative x-intercepts or negative real zeros that you're going to have, it's the same as the number of sign changes of f of negative x. Now, again, the thing that makes Descartes' rule of signs not that practical in real world use is because you say, well, it could be that number of sign changes, or it could be two less, or it could be four less, or it could be six less than that. So if I have five sign changes on f of negative x, I could have five negative x-intercepts, I could have three, I could have one. Uh, if I had four sign changes, I could have four x-intercepts that are negative, I could have two, or I could have zero. It always differs by that positive even integer less than that. Now, another thing that's a little bit helpful, it says if f of negative x has only one variation, same thing as f of x has one variation, you're guaranteed one positive x-intercept. In this case, if f of negative x has only one variation, then you know f has exactly one negative real zero. Okay. Now, let's see an example of that. In this one, I'm giving us f of x is equal to x to the fourth minus 14x cubed plus 71x squared minus 154x plus 120. So please notice here, you're starting off with a positive. Well, it's turning negative. That's one sign change. Then it turned positive. That's two sign changes. Negative, that's three. Positive. That's four. So this has four sign changes. So I can say, okay, uh, in order to use Descartes' rule of sign, all I would say is that, well, since there's four sign changes of f of x, the number of positive real zeros of f, it is either you could have four positive real zeros, you could have two, or you could have zero. Now, Descartes' rule of signs doesn't find them. It's just telling you how many that they're could be. There could be four, there could be two, there could be none. Now, what about the number of negative x-intercepts or negative real zeros this function has? In order to determine that, you'd have to take your function and find f of negative x. Here you see I've plugged a negative x everywhere I had an x in that original function. The negative x to the fourth, that's just the same thing as positive x to the fourth. However, the negative x cubed is going to change the sign on that. You said, well, that's going to make it a negative times x cubed, which changes this to a positive. So I can say, well, that's going to be plus 14x cubed. Negative x squared, that's the same thing as positive x squared, so no sign change on that term. And then I have minus 154 times a negative x, that's going to be plus 154x, and then I have a plus 120. Well now please notice f of negative x, every single solitary term is positive. So you say, okay, if I plug in a negative x, it makes all of the terms positive. What does that tell me? Well, it tells you that there's no variation in sign of f of negative x, which unequivocally tells you there are no negative real roots for f. Now, what does that also tell me? I know that the total number of roots has to be four. 
So this tells me that this equation either has four real roots, or sorry, four positive real roots, or it has two positive real roots and two complex roots, or it has zero positive roots and all four complex roots, because I know it does not have negative real roots. It either has four positive roots and no complex roots, two positive and two complex, or zero positive and zero complex, or sorry, zero uh, positive and four complex. But Descartes' rule of signs doesn't tell us anything more than how many potential positive and negative real roots you could have. It doesn't really help a whole lot as far as attacking the problem and finding those roots. Probably the rational zero test is more helpful for that, and then using your calculator or synthetic division after that. Okay, this is going to finish up this section, and please make sure you do try the homework and compare it with the homework that I've done out of the book out of this section, and also, as always, let me know if you have any questions. I love this section, and I would love to help you out with it if you need any.